you need to understand what instrumentation is used to characterize solar cells. But also interestingly, a lot of this is, instrumentation requires a lot of interesting and new optical design. So I'll emphasize those uh, optical design aspects of it. Now, again, uh, just to confirm, what we are trying to do is this uh, solar cell electrical measurements. We, we have short circuit current, um, open circuit voltage, mm -hmm. maximum output power, efficiency, pull factor, uh, definitions are shown here. Now, of course, in order to do this, you have to illuminate the solar cell. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to skip that video. That's so important. Now, because you don't want to have to take the solar cell outside and measure it all the time, because there's a lot of variability, whether you measure it in uh, Salt Lake City or whether you measure it in New York City. And it could be very different because of the differences in cloud cover or just differences in the angle of the sun. So. Uh, you really want some sort of standardized solar simulator, some way to simulate the effect of the sun. And this is an example of one that's commercially available. So this, and this has some interesting optics in it, so something to be aware of. First of all, we have the source as a xenon lamp. Then we have a ellipsoidal reflector. So it's similar to the paraboloid. The ellipsoid is a little bit easier to make, but all it does, it takes the light from the xenon lamp and tries to collimate it by coming up, direct it, and then you have a mirror, and then it goes through something called an optical integrator. All it does is that it simply cleans up the beam so it looks nice and uniform. And then you have a shutter so that uh, the light can be turned on and off. And then you have a spectral correction filter to make sure that the incident spectrum looks more like sunlight. And you have another mirror, and then you have a collimating lens to, to make the light more direct. And then there's a working plane. This is where you put the solar cell for the IV measurements or electrical measurements. So uh, these things can be purchased and uh, there are various kinds of lamps that you can use. Uh, this is from a company called Newport Instruments. Um, these are different spectra, which we saw this before. This is just a spectra of a tungsten halogen lamp uh, compared to, for instance, the M1 spectrum. Uh, this is a uh, um, uh, mercury lamp um, and this is a metal halide lamp. So different spectra. Some things are better for other than others. For instance, the uh, mercury lamp has more energy in the UV part of the spectrum or blue part of the spectrum, whereas the, um, the halogen lamps have more infrared part of the spectrum. It really depends on what kind of measurements you're doing. And of course, to get it perfect requires multiple sources, right? And that turns out very complicated. Another thing you want to measure something called quantum efficiency of a solar cell. Uh, this uh, is simply defined as the number of, uh, is the ratio of the number of electrons or charge carriers collected by a solar cell or created by the solar cell to the number of photons of a given wavelength incident in the solar cell. Simply, if I have n photons going in and I have m photo electrons coming out of my solar cell, the quantum efficiency simply m divided by n. Okay, of course the best case is 100%. One photon will give me one electron. This is a normal solar cell. There are some other interesting solar cells where you can get more, but anyway, we're not talk about it. It's an indicator of how good is a solar cell is at converting left sunlight to electricity. Uh, it should have a high spectral response at wavelengths where there is abundant uh, uh, photons in the incident light. Uh, obvious. So what does the QE look like? Uh, I'll just go over the curve here quickly. First of all, it's plotted versus wavelength. And this is quantum efficiency in percentage. At very low, very low wavelengths, uh, you have zero quantum efficiency. Very, very few carriers are created because they're too energetic and they're not captured because they saw the, the, the photons do not actually get absorbed properly because they are trapped in uh, defects and so on. This efficiency goes up as the wavelength increases. It is reduced at short wavelengths due to a process called surface recombination. It's a defect recombination. We'll talk more about this on Tuesday. In, the, in this region, it's relatively flat, but here it starts reducing again. Why? Because at longer wavelengths, you have uh, uh, defects on the bottom surface of the solar cell, or something called a rear surface passivation, and they reduce absorption at the low diffusion lengths. So the longer wavelengths are harder to be absorbed because you're closer to the band gap. 
And uh, of course, uh, beyond the band gap, it falls to zero, right? So because the photons don't have enough energy to be absorbed, so they fall off. And for silicon, it's a, the, the band gap is about 1100 nanometers, so 1.1 EV. Uh, the ideal uh, curve, of course, was that you want 100% everywhere and zero after the band gap. But of course, that's not possible, but just something to be aware of. There are two kinds of quantum efficiency, external and internal. And uh, the only thing I will emphasize here is that external QE includes effects of optical losses, such as the effect of the ARC, like we talked about, and reflection from the cell. Internal QE is basically what we just discussed. It excludes the effect of transmitted and reflected light. So again, these are terms that you should be familiar with, but I won't dwell too much about it. Now, uh, I, 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 you don't need to know the details of the, the measurements, but let's just look at the math here a little bit. Uh, uh, QE is defined, of course, as the ratio of the number of charge carriers divided by the number of incident photons at a given wavelength. It's a function of wavelength. The number of charge carriers is simply the current divided by the electron electronic charge, so that's the number of electrons. Uh, the number of incident photons is the power incident divided by the energy of one photon, right? HC over lambda, and everything else is, uh, is fine. And, and, and the way these measurements are done are that they have to use a reference detector as well, which is uh, I'm, I'm not terribly important for the sake of our discussion here. And uh, I am going to skip this. This is not too important. Um, I'm going to skip that. Oh, but actually, before I skip that, I just want to point out this is a setup used to do quantum efficiency measurements. Keep it, uh, one thing to point out: there are two sources here. So there's a deuterium source, a hydrogen isotope source, and there's a tungsten source here. So you're using two sources to get the different parts of the solar spectrum, simulating them. The other things to keep in mind: there's a chopper here, which is used with a uh, lock-in amplifier to do very, very precise measurements. And the rest of the stuff is related to the spectral uh, uh, separation because you're trying to do one wavelength at a time and that requires something called a monochromator. Um, but I, in the, the, the details of these designs are out of the scope of this discussion, so I'm not, I'm not gonna dwell on it. So the, the yeah, let's skip that, it's not terribly important. And uh, this is really what I want to st uh, stop, but. Essentially, uh, this optical design is interesting because you have a, a, a finite size source, right? Like the xenon lamp or mercury lamp, use a condenser uh, to, to essentially collect the light and collimate it as much as possible. And then you have a planar convex refocusing lens to uh, focus it into a monochromator slit. This is the input to the monochromator. This mo in input to the monochromator also shown here. And this, then gets imaged onto a grading, and the grading uh, it reflects the light, and, the, and, and that reflected light has a bunch of wavelengths like that. And you can pick off one wavelength at a time and measure each one uh, to, to eliminate the solar cell. That's how you actually do these measurements. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, but um, it's important to do this because different solar cells have responsivity to, uh, to different wavelengths differently. And we'll talk more about this in the, in the lecture on spectral splitting. So uh, here uh, you see the uh, response of amorphous silicon solar cells, uh, relatively cheap and abundant solar cell. Uh, this is plotting wavelength versus the responsivity. So amorphous silicon solar cell uh, peaks around um, this wavelength you know, in the visible, somewhere in the green. Um, whereas if you use gallium arsenide, which is a more expensive material, but much more efficient, you can see it's got a much higher quantum efficiency or responsivity. It peaks in the redder wavelength, in the infrared, about 820 nanometers. Whereas this, uh, oops. Sorry. This, uh, Copper uh, indium diselenide is a cheaper wavelength, a cheaper material uh, peaks at an even redder wavelength, uh, slightly uh, redder than the band gap of silicon. So you can see very, very different solar cells can respond very differently. So it's very important to understand this responsivity curve, especially if you're trying to design anti-reflection coatings or concentrators and things like that. And we'll again, um, talk more about this later on. 
And with that, uh, I am, that's my last slide and uh, we'll end here. Let's see if there are any questions. Um, I want to just remind you that Tuesday's lecture, um, please watch for your uh, Canvas announcement. There is a small chance that it will not be live. It might be pre-recorded and posted. So in that case, uh, you don't have to come to class. Just watch the video and make some notes. And I posted the resources here. Now I'll, I'll let you know. Otherwise, we'll have a, a presentation as usual. But it's uh, possible that the, uh, on Tuesday, you don't need to come to class. Uh, I will uh, also post the links to the Lasson Center opportunities that I showed at the very beginning of this class. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to me if any of you are interested in applying. Uh, it's a great opportunity. Um, so, okay, uh, and don't forget your assignment five is due on Tuesday. So make sure you submit that. And uh, with that, I guess we'll stop. Professor, uh, do we have any presentation on Tuesday? Not next Tuesday. Let's go back to the schedule. Uh, next presentation is November 23rd, right before oh. Thanksgiving. Thank you. That's presentation four, yeah. So the assignment five, which is the Canvas, is due Tuesday. The next assignment six is also posted on Canvas. You can look at it. That's due November 9th. Assignment seven, I haven't posted yet, but it's, it's already here, November 16th, but I'll post it on Canvas later. So everything is kind of planned out. You can already take a look. Okay, very good. Let's uh, let stop my sharing. And uh, thank you very much. See you, have a good weekend. See you all next uh, Tuesday or, or potentially on Tuesday. If not, then it'll be Thursday. Watch for announcements. Okay, thank you.